Let's see now. When you shift into second, the uh, power comes from the drive pinion to the... Or does it? Maybe... What's the matter, Fred? Having trouble learning the parts on the transmission? Well, I've learned the names all right, Tech. I'm just trying to figure out how they work. <laughs> this is a new one on me. I've been helping mechanics from coast to coast. But this is my first chance to help a parts man. Better get it off your chest, son. Well, first of all... Oh, hiya, Dutch. What do you have? Give me all the synchronizer parts for this transmission job, Fred. You working on a transmission? Say, maybe you could tell me something about how it works. I'd like to know... Yes, I'm out of time. Just give me my parts. Hey, why don't you give the kid a break, Dutch? Listen, I got a job to do. I can't... Uh, be... Somebody taught you. You weren't born with a wrench in your mitt. Oh, but he better catch on quick. You mean you'll give me some time, Dutch? Swell. In the first place, suppose you tell me what you know about this gearbox. Well... I know it's a collection of gears that'll give the driver whatever combination of speed and power he needs to meet traffic and road conditions. Well, that's it. I guess you know the story, Fred. Wait a minute. Let's go through the story paragraph by paragraph. For instance, I know the power comes in from the clutch end and goes out the prop shaft end. But I want to know what goes on in between. Well, for the... Come on, come on, give. Okay. In the first place, the gears that carry the power are mounted on the main shaft and the counter shaft. Now, when you shift gears, you mesh the proper main shaft gear with its mating counter shaft gear to give whatever ratio of engine speed to rear wheel driving power you need. The main shaft carries the synchronizer, the second speed gear, and the low and reverse sliding gear. The counter shaft carries the cluster gear. Now, is that enough? Enough. Listen, you square-headed Dutchman. You're not getting out of this thing so easy. Tell them what happens when you shift into low. Well, let's see. Uh, the counter shaft gear, we call it the cluster gear, is turned by the drive pinion. The pinion and the cluster gear are always in mesh. Now, when the driver shifts into low, the main shaft low and reverse gear slides forward on its splines to pick up the power from the counter shaft low speed gear and the driver starts off. I see. Now, how, how does he get into second? Well, he goes through neutral first by throwing the low and reverse gear into neutral. Then he'll pick up the gears that'll drive him in second gear. Here's how they work. The second speed gear of the counter shaft cluster and the second speed gear on the main shaft are always in mesh too. However, the main shaft's second speed gear rotates freely, so it's got to be locked to the shaft in order to drive the shaft. The locking is done by the synchronizer. The clutch gear, which is splined to the main shaft, carries the clutch gear sleeve on splines. When the driver shifts, he slides the sleeve over the clutch teeth on the shoulder of the second speed gear. So the power comes from the drive pinion through the cluster gear to the main shaft second speed gear. Then, uh... Then, since the second gear is locked to its shaft through the synchronizer, the power goes through the synchronizer to the main shaft and then out to the prop shaft. Well, you guys all caught up? Okay. Now, before he shifts into high, the driver moves the clutch sleeve into the neutral position. Then, as he shifts into high, he slides the clutch sleeve forward to mesh with the clutch teeth on the drive pinion. So the drive goes direct from the drive pinion through the synchronizer, the main shaft, and out the prop shaft. Now, uh, how about reverse? Well, in reverse, we use the reverse idler gear. It's on a separate shaft and is always in mesh with the reverse gear of the counter shaft cluster gear. When you shift, the main shaft low and reverse gear slides back to mesh with the reverse idler gear. I see. Then the idler gear picks up the power from the cluster gear and reverses it. So the main and prop shafts run backwards. Correct, Fred. Now can I take my synchronizer parts and get back to work? Oh, uh, uh Dutch, say, 
I've been trying to figure out what this thing does for the transmission. And do you suppose you Oh, could... brother, not again. Are you going to give the kid the lowdown, or am I going to climb up there and beat your ears down? Why, you underinflated tool jockey, you. Say, I ought to... <laughs> okay, okay. Let's see now. You brought me the two bronze stop rings, the three shifting floats, two synchronizer springs, the clutch sleeve, and the clutch gear. He knows that. Now he wants to find out how they work. Well, let's say you're in second and you want to shift into high. Naturally, you don't want any gear clashing when you shift, so it's the synchronizer's job to make the drive pinion and the main shaft turn at the same speed. And here's how it does the job. The inside of the stop ring is shaped like a cone to fit over the shoulder of the drive pinion, which is also shaped like a cone. As you shift, the clutch sleeve moves forward, carrying the shifting plates with it. The plates push the ring forward over the cone on the drive pinion. Now this means the stop ring will drag on the faster moving pinion, slowing it down to the speed of the synchronizer. Then you can shift without clashing. Okay. Now, the slots in the stop ring are wider than the shifting plates, so the teeth on the ring line up with the teeth on the sleeve. That means after the ring does its job of slowing down the drive pinion, the shift can be completed without clashing. What happens when the drive pinion does slow down? Well, here. Uh, see how the teeth on the sleeve and the teeth on the ring are chamfered? As you slide the sleeve against the ring, that chamfer action lets the ring move back in its slots to where the teeth will mesh, and you can complete the shift. Right? Right. Okay. Now, the only thing that's been keeping the ring from being forced around so it can mesh with the sleeve teeth is the dragging action of the ring on the pinion. Right? Right. And I begin to see the light. When the ring finally slows the pinion down, the dragging action stops, and the chamfer action lets the teeth mesh. Correct. And the shift can be completed. Sure. The sleeve slides on through the ring teeth and meshes with the clutch teeth on the drive pinion. Then the transmission is in high. Say, fellas, this record ain't going to be synchronized with the film unless somebody turns it over. I sure got the story of what happens when you shift those gears. Well, I'm glad I could help you. Be you know, ahead. Dutch, if I could just get the story on how this shifting is done, I'd be all set. Oh, now, wait a minute. I Come was... on, big shot. Spill the secrets of the controls. Uh, there aren't any secrets to the controls. Then you won't mind telling Fred all about them. Okay. Well... You remember how the synchronizer sleeve slides forward into high or back into second, and how the low and reverse gear slides back and forth? Yeah. Well, the sleeve and the gear are moved by shift forks. The forks are supported and guided by shift rails. The selector lever selects either the fork for the second and high gears or the fork for the low and reverse gears. And the operating lever moves the fork to give the driver the gear ratio he wants. I see. The selector lever moves this shifter lever into the notch in one of the forks. And then the operating lever moves the fork and gear backward or forward. That's the idea. Now, the operating and selector levers are connected by rods to the gear shift lever at the steering wheel. When you lift the gear shift lever toward the steering wheel, the action is transferred to the selector lever, and you're ready to use the low and reverse rail. Then, if you pull the gear shift lever toward you, you move the operating lever, and the rail moves the fork and gear forward so that you're in low. Well, that's the story in general, Dutch. But why don't you tell Fred about the adjustments you make sometimes? You got time. I I'll make it all right with the boss. Okay. Now, well, sometimes we do have to make some adjustments. For instance, if the gear shift lever seems to be traveling too far to complete the shift, probably the nut on the control rod stud is loose. 
And we set it right by putting the transmission itself in neutral with the gear shift lever. Then we put the gear shift lever in the horizontal position and tighten the nut. Sometimes we find a driver having trouble getting into low or reverse. Well, that means his selector lever isn't moving far enough. So, with the transmission in neutral, we loosen the lock nut on the front end of the selector rod and turn the adjusting nut until there's no play in the linkage. Then, we back her off a half a turn for clearance and tighten the lock nut. So, with the linkage adjustment right, we'll stay in gear, huh? The linkage is what gets you in gear, Fred. Staying in gear is something else. Dutch, tell Fred about keeping the shift rails in place. Eh, I might have known you'd bring that up. Well, you see, Fred, when you're in gear, a spring-loaded ball fits into a notch in the shift rail and holds it firmly. Then the gear won't slip out of mesh while you're driving. There are three of those notches or detents in each rail, one for each of the two gear positions and one for neutral. Now, when you shift, you move against the pressure of the detent ball spring, sliding the rail until the ball slips into the next detent. And I suppose in old transmissions, you might find detent springs that are too weak to hold the rails. Sure. They need replacing sometimes. Look, can the linkage move both rails and forks at the same time? Nope, because there's an interlock, which fits into a notch in each rail. Now, when one rail starts to move, it rides over the end of the interlock. This forces the interlock into the notch of the other rail, so that rail can't move. Of course, you've got to realize there's things that can go wrong so that even the detent balls can't keep the transmission in gear. Yeah, like if the clutch housing face isn't lined up with the crankshaft, or the housing bore isn't true with the crankshaft. If either one is misaligned, the drive pinion is thrown out of line. Then the teeth on the pinion bear heavy along one section and light along another section of the clutch sleeve. That puts a lot of strain on the few teeth that are carrying the load, huh? Sure. Where's the teeth down? Not only that, the sleeve will walk right out of mesh with the pinion teeth. In other words, the transmission suddenly jumps into neutral. So jumping out of high can be caused by the clutch housing face or bore being out of line, huh? Well, that's one possible cause, anyway. Uh, you can find out if the housing is misaligned by mounting a dial gauge to the crankshaft or flywheel so you can check the face and the bore for runout. Look, Dutch, why don't you lend Fred your reference book? It gives lots more dope on checking alignment and other things he'll want to know. Okay, but I better get it back. Thanks, Dutch. Say, can anything beside the controls keep you from getting into gear? Well, if the clutch sleeve teeth get battered up, the driver will have a tough time shifting. Of course, if the clutch itself is dragging so the pinion never stops turning, the synchronizer can't do its job, and the driver will have a heck of a time getting her into gear. That'd probably make the transmission pretty noisy, too. Well, we call that clashing. Noise is something else. Such as what? Well, if you hear a steady clicking you probably got rough bearings on the pinion or main shaft. If it's a whine that seems to get higher when you pick up speed, you'll usually find the teeth are rough. If there are any broken teeth, you'll hear a fast bumping sound. And if there's a clunk when you give her the gas, maybe the thrust washers are allowing too much end play in the cluster gear. What the dickens can cause all those troubles? Well, I figure it's usually the way the car is driven. You're probably right, Dutch. The driver who doesn't get her all the way into low or reverse before he applies the power can break a tooth on the low and reverse gear. And the guy who shifts from second to high so fast that the stop ring can't synchronize the drive pinion is going to end up with no synchronization at all. I don't suppose it matters to you whose fault it is, Dutch. You've got to find out why the transmission is noisy or hard to shift or jumps out of gear. That's right. And there's only one way to find out. Tear the transmission apart and decide which part is acting up. Well, tell me, how do you decide that? Now look, if you two birds don't let me get back to work, some owner's going to be jumping on my neck. <laughs> okay, Dutch. I guess we better let you off the hook. But one of these days, you'll have to give Fred some more dope. 
Fred, I'll bet you'd like to know more about transmission troubles, wouldn't you? You bet. I'd like to know what happens to those parts after they've been run a while. And I'd like to know how to build one of those jobs up and how to tell when to replace parts. Sure you would. And so would all the rest of the boys who've been listening to us. That's why I'm coming back real soon to give you fellas the rest of the story on troubleshooting in the transmission. <laughs> <laughs>